Hey there. Well, here I am. I'm not teaching at the church or at River Glen or at Whitestone. I'm in my home because our incredible videographer is a little under the weather. And guess what? Teaching needs to go on. Even though I did teach, hey, it wasn't videoed. So I'm going to be teaching to you right from here, right from my home. So we are in Ephesians, right? We're in Ephesians 4. Remember, Ephesians 1 through 3 is all about doctrine. Remember, he's teaching us who we are in Jesus Christ, how we're seated in the heavenlies already. And this is Paul who's talking to the church of Ephesus. Now we're in chapters 4 through 6, which is working out our faith. It's practical faith, right? And so we had just gone through and learned about the seven unities, the seven unities in the church, the church, the body of Christ, right? Not a building, but you and you and me as believers, right? Body of Christ. So let's go through those once again. Okay, the, uh, it, so the description of the unity of the church. We have one body, right? Body of Christ, one spirit, the Holy Spirit. We have one hope, Jesus is returning. We have one faith, one baptism, and that's spirit baptism, how we came to know Jesus as our Savior. The Holy Spirit came to live in us. That's one baptism. It's spirit baptism. It's not talking about water baptism here. One God and Father of us all, who is above all, through all, and in you all. Remember, he's talking to believers, so he lives in us. Okay, so Paul now is going to be talking about the way God works unity in the church. And it's through the spiritual gifts of leadership in the body of Christ. Okay, so we're going to look at verses 7 through 10. And I'm just going to read the beginning of it in the New King James Version, which says, the, uh, But to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Actually, let's stop right there. This is the giving of spiritual gifts to the church. And verse 7, but to each one of us, grace, right? Undeserved favor, grace, was given according to the measure of God's, I should say, of Christ's gift. Okay, so we all have grace. We all have grace given to us according to the measure of Jesus' gift. Okay, so this is the basis of God's distribution of spiritual gifts through his church. It's by grace. It's always by grace. Remember, we're saved by grace through faith, right? We walk in grace. We stand in grace. And when everything is said and done, Peter tells us we'll still be standing in grace, in his grace. It's undeserved favor. God's riches at Christ's expense. It's the free, unmerited giving of God. No one, no one deserves or has earned spiritual gifts. No one. The Holy Spirit distributes them as he wills. Okay, so let's do, let's just stop here for a minute because Paul does an abrupt change of thought here now. The attention is away from the, I should say, the attention is turned from the unity of believers to what has been done for each believer. What has been done for each believer? Once again, verse 7 of chapter 4 of Ephesians. Remember, he's writing to believers. But to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. Apportioned it. Okay, so not one member of the body has been left out in the distribution of gifts. Nope, not you, not me, not anyone in the body of Christ. We each have a gift and some have quite a few gifts, okay? Every believer has a gift. Every believer has a gift and that it should be exercised according to the glory of Christ, right? Not for our gain, but for his glory, for his glory. It means each of us has a gift. So the key chapter of gifts actually is 1 Corinthians 12, if you want to go to that later and read it. And it emphasizes the variety of gifts that have been given to us as believers by the Holy Spirit, thereby showing the unity of the body. So there's diversities of gifts 
right? Okay, but each one is used for the common good. It's for the common good. So every one of us, every believer, has some contribution to make toward the body of Christ as a whole. That's you, that's me, okay? Not one of us can say, oh, our gift isn't significant. No, it's toward the common good of our body, okay? All gifts must be faithfully exercised if the body is to function as Christ intends it to. See, if a member doesn't function properly, the rest of the body will be less efficient and have to compensate for the loss, right? Okay, just think about our physical body. Okay, you Green Bay Packer fans out there, right? Just think about Aaron Rodgers, his toe. I mean, everybody's like, well, it's a toe. No, it was his toe. And it affected the common good of his body to be able to be a stellar quarterback, okay? And so, and so it's the same thing with us. Spiritually, as the body of Christ, if a member doesn't function properly, the rest of the body will be less efficient and then we'll have to compensate for that loss. Listen to 1 Corinthians 12, 21 through 25. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And the parts that we think are less honorable, we treat with special honor. And the parts that are unpresentable are treated with special modesty. While our presentable parts need no special treatment. But God has put the body together, giving greater honor to the parts that lacked it so that there should be no division in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern one for another. So no one can say, oh, my gift is not as good as your gift, or hey, my gift is better than your gift. No one can say that. Once again, back to Ephesians 4 verse 7. Grace is given according to the measure of the gift of Christ. So if the gift for ministry requires much enablement, God gives accordingly. In other words, there's always sufficient grace. Always sufficient grace. Grace upon grace upon grace upon grace upon grace upon grace. It never stops. There's always, always sufficient grace to meet any need. And this grace that's referred to has to do with the exercise of special gifts for service in the body of Christ. So we function for the common good well together. So it's the Spirit's enablement for the ministry. 2 Corinthians 9, 8 tells us this. And God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. What was the operative word there? All, all things, all times, all that you need abound in every good work. How great is that? It's grace upon grace upon grace upon grace. So then Paul then in Ephesians 4 gives a background in telling of the gifts for service that Christ has given. Now I'm going to read this out of the Amplified Version because it gives a few more descriptive words. So it's Ephesians 4 if you're following along. Ephesians 4, 8 through 11 in the Amplified Version. Therefore, it says, When he ascended on high, he led captivity captive, and he bestowed gifts on men. Verse 9. Now this expression, he ascended, what does it mean except that he also previously descended from the heights of heaven into the lower parts of the earth? He who descended is the very same as he who also has ascended high above all the heavens, that he... His presence might fill all things that is the whole universe. And his gifts to the church were varied, and he himself appointed some as apostles, special messengers, representatives, some as prophets who speak a new message from God to the people, some as evangelists who spread the good news of salvation, and some as pastor teachers to shepherd and guide and instruct. 
That was Ephesians 4, 8 through 11 in the Amplified Version. Notice the phrase in verse 8, when he ascended on high. These words refer to Christ going to heaven after his resurrection. After his resurrection. So, where had Jesus Christ been previously in eternity past? With his Father, with the Holy Spirit, in eternity past, forever and ever and ever and ever, okay? But then what? Then he came to earth, he took on a human body, he lived an obedient life, and then what? He died for the sins of the world. He then descended to Hades, but rose from there and was on earth for 40 days before ascending to heaven. So the Bible says that after he had risen from the dead and had given instructions to his disciples, Acts 1-9, listen, and after Jesus said these things, he was caught up as they looked on and a cloud took him up and out of sight. You know, I know it's way better to be alive now with the Holy Spirit in us, who is our power. But wouldn't you love to have been there when Jesus ascended up and out of sight? Yeah, that would have been amazing. See, this ascension <clears throat> took place the day before Pentecost. Okay, Pentecost in Acts 2 is when the disciples were to wait in the upper room for the Holy Spirit to come. And that was the day that the church was born, that the church was born. So the ascension, Jesus's ascension, took place the day before Pentecost when the church was born. So then let's go into this. Speaking about Christ's descent into Hades, Peter actually says in Acts 2, verses 29 through 31, and I read, Brothers, I may confidently and freely say to you regarding the patriarch David that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. And so being a prophet, <clears throat> and knowing fully that God had sworn to him with an oath that he would seat one of his descendants on his throne, he foresaw and spoke prophetically of the resurrection of the Christ, the Messiah, the Anointed One, that he was not abandoned in death to Hades, the realm of the dead, nor did his body undergo decay. So back to Ephesians 4 verse 8, says when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. And if you notice, that's in quotes because Paul is quoting from Psalm 68, 18, a prophecy concerning the same truths. He says, you have ascended on high. You've led them away. You've led away captive, your captives. <coughs> Excuse me. You have received gifts for men. So the context of Ephesians 4, 8 has to do primarily with victory and gifts. Now, let's look at the context of this, okay? Because it was custom in biblical times for an army to return home for victory. <coughs> Excuse me, my goodness. Hold on. <coughs> I have to have a little drink of my coffee here. All right, let's try this again. I'm so sorry. Okay, let's go back to the context. All right, it was custom in biblical times for an army to return home for victory following its leader in triumph. So after the triumphal procession with captives and spoils that had been taken, the military leader would then what? Distribute the gifts. He would distribute the gifts, which included the spoils. So, so Paul would have been well acquainted with this custom, and in Ephesians would have been referring to the victory in Christ in defeating his foes and then giving his gifts to his own people, the church, the body of Christ. So Christ's triumph over his foes is mentioned where? In Colossians 2 verse 15, and I quote, and having disarmed the powers and authorities, he, meaning Jesus, 
made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. By the cross. Then he goes to Hebrews 14, chapter 2, verses 14 and 15. It also tells of Christ's triumph. Since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity so that by his death, he might break the power of him who holds the power of death, that is the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. So at the cross, at the cross, right? Christ broke the power of Satan, so the time of Christ's triumph was when he died on the cross for the sin of the world. For you, for me, the world. Past, present, future sin. Christ has triumphed over all satanic powers, and although he is not recognized by everyone as Lord now, oh, there will come a time where he will be. It tells us that in Philippians 2, 8 through 11. And being found in appearance of man, talking of Jesus, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth, and under the earth, in heaven, on earth, and under the earth. And every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. I love those verses. I love them. So when Christ is leading captivity captive in verse 8 in Ephesians 4, it's referring to the time when he triumphed over his enemies on the cross. And having triumphed, he gave gifts unto his people. He gave gifts unto his people. So the context of Ephesians 4 is how believers are prepared to effectively serve Christ. First, they must be delivered from Satan's power by which he disrupts their progress. And remember, Jesus already triumphed over him on the cross. And secondly, they must be given gifts to then do what? To enable them to properly function as the body of Christ. To properly function as the body of Christ. So let's just stop here for a minute and look at the order of events. Okay, one, Jesus died on the cross, which is the only means of our salvation. Big death blow to Satan and his power. So Christ spoiled Satan's power so that believers, you and me, can be victorious now in spiritual warfare. We're going to talk about this later uh, on uh, probably in May, towards the end of um, the year in May in Ephesians 6. But let's quote it now, Ephesians 6, 11 through 17. What are we supposed to do? Put on the full armor of God. Put on the full armor of God so that, so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle isn't against what? Yeah, that's right. It's not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, Put on the full armor of God. Aren't you glad it's not our armor? Because that wouldn't work at all. It's his armor. We put it on so that when the day of evil comes, it doesn't say if, it says when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. Just stand. We got his armor on. Stand your ground. And after you've done everything, guess what you do? You keep standing. You just keep standing. He says in verse 14 of chapter 6 of Ephesians, Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. How many? All. All the flaming arrows of the evil one. 
Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. That's our only offensive weapon, God's Word. Okay, so let's look at the timeline once again, okay? What is it? Order of events. Jesus died on the cross, okay? Secondly, Christ descended into Hades, the place of the departed dead. Thirdly, Christ rose from the dead, thereby proving the validity of all that he said. Remember, we serve a risen Christ. Jesus isn't dead. He, he rose. And he's seated at the right hand of God the Father right now. And everything's under his feet. All power and authority are in Jesus Christ. And he's interceding for us right now. And he's making a home for us right now. And he will come and get us someday or take us home. How great is that? We serve a living Christ. It's a relationship that we have. Is that a religion? All the other religions, guess what? They serve a dead God. Oh, no, no, no. Christianity, Jesus Christ is alive. We serve a living Jesus. Fourthly, he ascended into heaven to the Father, thereby giving proof of what? Of his entry into eternal exaltation. Right? God the Father said, therefore, every name, right? The name of Jesus, above every name, and every tongue will proclaim that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And then fifthly, he sent the Holy Spirit to indwell those who know him as Savior, believers. And through the Holy Spirit, Christ then triumphantly lives in the church, which is his body, because he's the head. Matthew 16, 18 says, I will build my church. This is Jesus. I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. So Christ has gained victory at the cross and nothing or no one, nothing or no one would be able to overpower the church, his body, you and me. Christ lives triumphantly in and through his church and through the spirit distributes his gifts to us as believers. So in Ephesians 4, however, the subject, I want to share this with you, the subject is not gifts given to the believers. That's more in 1 Corinthians. But he's talking about gifted believers than what? Given to the church. Gifted believers given to the church. Because having spoke of Christ's ascension, Paul added verse 11, so Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastor teachers. So Jesus had received men from the Father and now was giving them to the church. When I say men, I mean humankind, okay, to the church. In Jesus's prayer of intercession, he said this, John 17, verse 6. I have revealed you to those whom you gave me out of the world. Father. They were yours. You gave them to me and they have obeyed your word. He goes on in John 17, 9 through 12. This is Jesus speaking. I pray for them. I am not praying for the world, but for those you have given me, for they are yours. All I have is yours and all you have is mine and glory has come to me through them. I will remain in the world no longer, but they are still in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me, so that they may be one as we are one. While I was with them, I protected them and kept them safe by that name you gave me. That name you gave me. So these that Christ had received from the Father, he gave to the church as what? As apostles, as prophets, as evangelists, as pastor teachers. So Christ is forming the body and the spirit is preparing each believer for that particular ministry. So in verse 11 of chapter four of Ephesians, the apostles and prophets Right, gifted men in the first century of the church. We have their writings in scripture, so we still benefit from these gifted men that were given to the church. 
It is through them that the doctrinal foundation of the church was laid. And then we have what? The evangelists. Refers to those that are gifted in proclaiming the good news. The message of the gospel. Gospel means good news. The message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I know what you're thinking. Well, the one, biggest one that I know is what? Billy Graham. Billy Graham, who has now moved to heaven. Billy Sunday. There are many evangelists that come to our mind. However, even though all are not gifted evangelists, each believer is to, quote, from 2 Timothy 4, 5, do the work of an evangelist. We're to do the work of an evangelist. So even though you're gifted in other areas, we're to be faithful, right? I mean, we're ambassadors of Jesus Christ. We've got that, you know, incredible banner on us, right? We're witnesses for him. How are you doing in that? It's a good, good thing that we get to be evangelists. I remember a lady coming to me years ago and she's like, oh, well, Margo, I don't have a gift of evangelism like you do and how you share the good news and this, this. So, so you know, I don't have to witness or share anything. I'm like, um, why wouldn't you want to? I mean, we have the best news ever that we can share with the world. And he left us here to do just that, right? As we're being conformed to the likeness of his son, we can share our story. We can give them hope, and hope doesn't disappoint. It's a good, good thing to be an evangelist. It's just sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. And guess what? Nobody can take your story from you. Tell them how your life changed through Jesus. So prophets apostles, evangelists, and then he also gave to the church pastor teachers, okay, in verse 11. So pastors are shepherds of God's flock. God has especially gifted them in dealing with problems with his children to encourage them, to comfort them, and build them up in faith by teaching God's word. And because of the construction of the original language in the Greek here, pastor teacher gift is considered a combined gift. It's like pastor hyphen teacher. So the Lord not only gifts his people, but then he chooses place of service. I mean, absolutely nothing in Christ's service is left to mere human judgment. He's putting together the body of Christ whether I'm a toe or an eye or a mouth or a leg or an ear, right? Just like our body, every single one is important for the common good. And that's a good, good thing. And then he also um, chooses a place of service. Now, um, many of you know I was on 105.3 The Fish years ago, which is now Caleb. I never raised my hand for that. I just kept my heart ready and then people came after me. And then I was on air on the morning show on 105.3 The Fish uh, for about five years. Okay, so, so through the gifting, right, that he has given me, then he chose a place of service. And you guys, it's for a season of time. It's for a season of time. Many of us get all messed up with, oh, it needs to be. No, it's for a season of time. And then he's the door opener. He opens the next door. He opens the next door. And we keep our heart ready and we just keep walking through because he's gifted us in these areas. So next week, hopefully our incredible, wonderful videographer will be back. And we're going to be going through um, some of the gifts he's given his church and reveal Christ's purpose in giving them. So please read ahead in Ephesians 4 and 12 and forward because we're going to be digging in even more. So thanks so much for joining me and thanks for so much for actually coming into my home on my iPhone and being able to uh, continue to have the teaching go forward. Uh, I'm so thrilled for those of you who are um, doing uh, Bible study alone, as well as many of you now are doing them um, in groups. I mean, we just have a new group now that uh, is happening in Alaska. How great is that? So welcome to you.
Anyway, have a tremendous day. Okay? Love you. Talk to you later. Bye.